All right, so even though we're beginning Revelation 3 tonight, we want to go back to Revelation 2, Revelation chapter 2, and verse, verses 26 and 27, um, just to remind us of something and, and, and uh, bring us a little bit closer to what this vision that John is seeing uh, represents. Uh, Revelation 2.26 says, And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father. Um, now, this passage really is also found in Psalm uh, 2. Psalm 2, verse 8 and 9 says, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So the first thing we want to highlight tonight is that Revelation chapter 2, 26 and 27 is a repetition of Psalms 2 and verse 8. Now, on the surface, the context of Psalms 2 seems to be about uh, King David or uh, more um, accurately, the, the one who would come through the royal line of David, who we know as the Messiah or Jesus Christ. So in Psalms 2, it's talking about this a descendant of David who would sit upon his throne and rule forever, who is Jesus Christ. All right, he's the one who would receive authority to rule over the nations, okay, and wins the victory. However, in Revelation, again, quoting Psalms 2, he says, But he that overcometh. Obviously, this is talking about the believers. It's talking about us, the church. So I want us to see the connection there where on the one hand, Psalms is talking about the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Revelation is talking about the church. There is a connection between us and Christ in the authority the rulership that will be given to us. We're going to be ruling with Christ. This dominion, this authority, this rule, it is given to, the, to, to Christ, but it's, it is also given to the church. We are going to rule and reign with Christ. And this is also spoken of in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2 Verse 11 to 13 says, It is a faithful saying, If we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. And then it says, If we deny him, he also will deny us. Okay? So, in Second Timothy, we find... Two powerful truths. First, just as it says in Revelation, if we persevere, right? If we persevere, verse 26 of Revelation 2, he that overcometh and keep my words to the end. Okay? Second Timothy 2, verse 12, if we suffer, we shall reign with him. Right? So the believer who endures who holds steadfast, who perseveres, 
we will rule the nations with Christ. Okay? That is important for us to grasp as believers. Right? And then the second truth is, if we decide to disown Christ, if we deny him or disown him, he will disown us. Okay? So the hope of every believer is that in concert with Christ, we're going to rule the nations. However, if we disown him, if we fall away, if we give up on our faith, if we don't endure through the trials and the tribulations and the tests, Christ will disown us. Now, the most popular doctrine today is what? Once saved, always saved. But how can that stand up against this truth? Right? Because it speaks of one who will be disowned by Christ. Okay? Now, they might tell you, well, the believer who uh, is disowned was never who is disowned by Christ or denied by Christ. They were never truly believers. They were pretenders. Okay. Yet the scriptures speaks clearly that one can have his redemption reversed. Okay. So understand, you cannot disown something you never owned, okay? A believer cannot disown Christ because he never, I'm sorry, an unbeliever can never disown Christ because he never owned him in the first place, okay? And so the warning to us is that as believers who were once owned by Christ, if we do not endure to the end, if we do not persevere, we can find ourselves being disowned or denied. Okay? Verse 27 in, in Revelation 2 says, Revelation 2, 27 says, He shall rule them with a rod of iron. Okay? Again, it is speaking to believers who overcome, that we're going to rule with Christ with a rod of iron. This is symbolic of a king's scepter. Okay, It is speaking of a scepter. The iron rod means to rule with absolute, unbreakable, and unyielding authority. It means to rule without compromise. It means to not tolerate. Okay? To not it's 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 a rule of intolerance. It will not tolerate any sin, any compromise, right? Now, what will be the standard of that rule that believers will rule with? What will be that standard of justice? that they, along with Christ, will rule with. That is so inflexible. Well, guess what? It is by the Word of God. It is by the Word of God, right? So when we see uh, uh, preachers and teachers today who operate with a certain amount of inflexibility, and again, the means of committing the gospel may change, but the message must never change, right? So there might be flexibility in how the gospel is communicated. But for those preachers who are inflexible with the standards of the doctrine and the truth of the gospel, guess what? They are the ones who will rule with Christ because that is the way that we will be ruling when Christ returns, right? But we see the popularity and the majority, it bodes with those who are flexible with the gospel. But here, the scriptures are very clear that upon Christ's return, believers 
will be reigning with him and there will be intolerance towards anything that is against the word of God. Right? Now, again, in, in, in Revelation 2, we talked about that Jezebel woman who claims to be a prophet. Right? And we should learn this lesson. We touched on it a bit last week. Right? That is that people could not distinguish between truth and error. Okay? We need no more prophecy than what God has given in his word. Right? The word of God is reliable and trustworthy. And so many believers gave audience and allegiance to a prophet whom they believed was real, but in fact was not. And today there are too many who are being led astray by false prophets. Now we also looked at the sins that were common in some of these churches in chapter 2. And it deals with uh, uh, sexual related sins and foods offered to idols. The, the, the point that he's trying to bring is, remember, those are associated with pagan worship. So false prophets and incorporating the worship practices of the world into the church was the main thrust of God's anger towards these churches. We should learn and take heed to this, this warning because deception Falsehood and tolerance of God prohibitions have always been Satan's chief method of defeating God's people. And they have always been at the core of divine judgment. So let's go to chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, and we're not going to read the entire thing. We ask you to read in advance. But verse 1 says, to the angel of the church in Sardis, right? These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Notice that, folks. That it speaks of one who possesses, hath or has, the sevenfold spirit of God. Now, the spirit of God, we more commonly know as the Holy Spirit. That's what we call the Holy Spirit. Okay? So if if the sevenfold spirit is the spirit of is the spirit of God or the Holy Spirit, then it means then that there is one who has the divine spirit or the Holy Spirit of God. Okay, And if one has the Spirit, that means they have authority over the Spirit. So therefore, if this divine being, now again, since chapter 1, we have, we have, we have, we have seen different um, associations with this, this being that John sees. There are different descriptions, but notice there is no name given. And we've dealt with the duality where we see the, 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 the divinity and the humanity in one, but yet there's no name given. So we know that Christ is mentioned as part of that divine being. Okay? And yet it says that Christ then would have the, Holy, the, the, the seven spirits or the Holy Spirit. Christ has authority over the Holy Spirit. Again, this defies the doctrine of a co-equal trinity because if the divine being has authority over the spirit, then how could they be co-equal? All right? Just want to bring out those things out of this text. Now, Sardis uh, was on a route. We, we, stopped, we, we studied that. Okay, and at one point it was one of the greatest cities. Uh, its capital was Lydia. And Sybil was the god, was the patron god uh, of that area. And it was said that Sybil had power 
of the resurrection from the dead. Now, God immediately hits Sardis with an accusation. Verse 1, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, but he says you are dead. Okay? Remember, their patron God was Sibyl, who supposedly had power of resurrection from the dead. And God says to this church in Sardis, you are phonies. Okay? You have a reputation. Remember the word name means reputation. You have a reputation of being alive, but in reality, you are dead. So God is speaking of their spiritual condition. Okay? He says, Your sincere ministry have earned you admirable reputation. However, you no longer retain the same character of passion for the gospel. Okay? You lack zeal for God. Okay? God uses the term life, the terms life and death to characterize their spiritual condition. At first, they were spiritually alive. They had a zeal for God. They had a zeal for the gospel. They had a zeal to see the kingdom of God advance. But now they had become spiritually dead. But yet, there were activities still going on. Okay? They were able to disguise their spiritual decay. Okay? But God was examining their hearts. Many in the congregation, in other words, they, 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 they continued their religious practice. Okay? They looked like believers to the unobservant eye. But on the inside, they were dead. They were spiritual corpses and many were joining them. Okay? There was the tiniest bit of spiritual life left within the group. But they were dangerously close to extinct, being extinguished altogether. Saints, we don't want to become a church where it's just rituals, where we go through the motions and we just follow a program. There must be life. There must be joy. There must be zeal. There must be passion. There must be love, forgiveness, true fire burning on the inside of the church. This was the state of the church in Sardis. So he says in verse 2, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect. How is it that this group of believers were in a spiritually lifeless state and yet they were not aware of it? Something had gone terribly wrong and all their spiritual sensitivity seems to have become suppressed. As a child of God, you never want to find yourself where you're just practicing religion. You're just being religious. Your faith is dead. Many of us, we profess faith, but at the first sign of difficulties, setbacks, trials, we lose hope. Where is your faith? When all around, it's easy to have faith when everything is going well. It's easy to say you believe in God when things are all right. But true faith comes alive in impossible situations, in dead situations, in setbacks and unfavorable circumstances. And so as a church, we've got to believe when others don't believe. We've got to rejoice when others are not rejoicing. That is the type of faith we ought to have individually. We can't go to church every Sunday dressed up, looking like we're believers, looking like we're a church, going through the motions of church, and yet there's no worship. 
There's no true worship. Somebody has to pump us. We got to find the right music. We got to find the right song. Somebody has to beg us. Come on, folks. That's not, that is the state of Sardis. And unfortunately, it can be the state of so many of us. On the surface, all looks good and normal. But yet they have become so lazy and lethargic in their worship and service that God is about to take away their light. Everyone finds it so difficult to make sacrifices for God. We find it difficult to do things for God. That is a state of deadness, folks. Okay? They had become so inward-looking and self-preoccupied that simply existing and keeping up a disguise of being religious was good enough for them. That is the state of Sardis. This call from the Lord to wake up and strengthen what little remains before it's gone is a call to carry out their responsibility. God says that what you're doing is incomplete in his sight. So it's not that they weren't doing things that seemed to be good. They were doing them but in the wrong spirit. Worship should not become a burden, folks. Prayer should not be a burden. Fasting should not be a burden. Reading your Bible, studying your Bible should not be a burden. Exhorting one another should not be a burden. A burden. Teaching a Bible study, going out and reaching the lost should not become a burden. All right? Uh, 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 taking part in ministry in the church, when that becomes a burden, it is evidence that your light is being snuffed out. Your light is going out. You're losing zeal. You're losing strength. That should be a wake-up call to all believers. What was the remedy for their condition of the spiritual coma? Verse 3 says, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come on thee. God says it is to remember what they had received and heard and obey it and turn from their sin. Bottom line, the word of God and obedience had gone missing. It is amazing how many people today say they are believers, are faithful in church attendance, but when it comes time, when it comes time for them to obey the word of God, they impose their own thoughts, their own ideas upon their actions. Well, I think, I believe, when the word of God is staring them right before their eyes. This church had become a social group of nice people. And they congratulated themselves every day. Verse 4, the Lord says, there are still a few remaining. There's a handful of them. In other words, there's a remnant. So thank God for the faithful few that are always amongst in the church. But should we be a church that only exists where it's the 20% who is pulling 80% of the load? That is what the Barna Group research has proved it, proved that 20% does 80% of the work. Why is it that the zeal of the Lord must only reside in the small handful while others come and get the benefit of others praying, others fasting, others denying themselves, others doing outreach, others doing Bible study? Oh, the whole church rejoices. When three people get baptized and five people get the Holy Ghost and four new members join the church. But how many of them in the church will say, I'd like to teach a Bible study. I want to help with outreach. When it comes time for the real sacrifice, no one participates or it's only a few. Saints of God, that is the state of Sardis. And unfortunately, that is the, the state of so many churches today. So there are a handful who have uh, not become unclean. And because they have not defiled themselves, God says that 
They are worthy. They shall walk with me in white, he says, for they are worthy. So I want to encourage those 20%. I know it's tiring. I know sometimes it's discouraging. Praise God. To see the church packed on Sunday and so scanty on fasting service. Church is packed and everybody's rejoicing on Sunday. When they hear a word, when they get a song. But yet when it's time, praise God, to do the hard work, it's always just the faithful few. But I encourage you tonight, persevere, persevere. He that endures to the end, the Bible says, shall be saved. Verse 5, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Notice, God says that he will not blot their name out of the book of life. So understand, folks, there is a book. There is a heavenly book where names are being added and names are being erased. Oh, please, get that into your mindset. There's a book where names are being added and names are being erased. So you have those whose names may never have been added. You have those whose names become added. And then you have those whose names who were added. But because... They do not endure. Their names can be erased. These are believers who have fallen. Or the Lord would not tell them to return. See? Okay? He would not tell them to return. These are believers who have been exposed for what they have become. And God says to them, return, repent, change. Okay? Okay? And if you want, he will erase your name from the book of life. Now, you cannot have your name erased from somewhere that it was never there. Okay, folks? Please. Once saved, always saved is a demonic doctrine sent to deceive the church in these last days. Okay? And preachers who embrace it, they themselves are deceived. And we should pray for them. Don't hate them. Pray for them. That God will open their eyes to the spirit of deception that has blanketed the world. Okay? He says, I will not blot out your name. Means your name was there. You were a believer. You were saved. But because you did not continue. Okay? Your name can be removed. Then he says, I will acknowledge them before my father. Okay? Sardis was under much pressure. They lived in a pagan environment and the pressure to conform to the social norms was ever present. The charges that God places against them reflected a condition of spiritual stagnation. They became spiritually lazy. This is the church that should trouble us the most because the believers there were so self-deceived. They thought that they were in good standing with God. They appeared sincere and religious. Their self-satisfaction was only from their perspective. God saw otherwise. They seemed to have no obvious outward flaws. Unlike the other churches, they weren't accused of worldliness or false teaching, but the Lord saw within what the Lord saw within them reflected the opposite of their outward appearance. They were so religious, they were so spirited, you know, they looked holier than thou. Praise God. What was the cause of their inward decay? At first, they cherished and studied the scriptures to guide them. They loved the Lord and wanted to be more like him. But as time went on, their zeal for God diminished. They lost sight of the fact that the word of God was a vital anchor for them. Okay? 
And it was something for them to measure themselves against. In other words, rather than measuring themselves against the word, they began to compare themselves with others. Oh, we're better than that, those folks over there because... You know, well, you know, we are, our dresses are longer, our, 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 you know, we cover our heads and, you know, they, they, they would compare themselves based upon their own standards as opposed to the word of God, right? And so they lacked a proper knowledge of scripture, which means they lacked a proper knowledge of God's will. And if we don't know God's will, we cannot do God's will. Okay? James 1, 22 to 24 reminds us. It says, verse 22 says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his face in a glass. He beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. So knowing God's word is not enough, folks. We must do it. We've harped on the Shema. Okay? The second thing is that we cannot know that what we should be doing without knowing God's word. Sardis is an example of what happens when we don't know God's word and instead do much religious activity that we assume we are pleasing God. Without the scriptures as a mirror to look into, to test if what we're doing agrees with God's will, we have no measuring stick. It is true that the Holy Spirit resides in us as a guide. However, the Holy Spirit is only one piece of the puzzle. Folks, this is the dilemma that the church is finding itself in. And it is amazing how much of us who call ourselves apostolics, Pentecostals, one name, Jesus name, whatever, right? Holy world or whatever. It is amazing. Of a, uh, uh, it is so amazing and too prevalent today that with the Holy Spirit in us, we no longer need Bible knowledge because somehow the Holy Ghost replaces Bible knowledge, right? We believe that the Holy Spirit will tell us supernaturally whatever God wants us to know or do and what is right or wrong. We have replaced the Holy Scriptures with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was never meant to replace the Holy Scriptures. Okay? This is a distortion of what the Bible says. The Holy Spirit is a teacher, yes. But his main duty is to help us to know and understand what the Bible says and how to apply it in every situation. Okay? The Holy Spirit is not your personal, customized word of God to redefine evil and sin person by person. Okay? This is, this is becoming one of the greatest errors that I'm seeing in our day. Okay? That everyone believes that there is this personal revelation that God speaks to me. And because God has spoken to me, then somehow I have the authority to do whatever I want to do and say whatever I want to say because God has spoken to me. Right? Folks, get yourselves in order. Get yourselves in order. Okay? The proper order is submission to the word of God first. Okay, because the spirit of God will never lead us contrary to the word of God. Let's go to the next church, Philadelphia. All right. Verse seven. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write: These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. All right. So, God has put before this brethren in Philadelphia a door that no man can shut. It means the Lord has set out a mission and a path for these believers and no one has the authority to change it or stop it. And then it says, 
Uh, verse 9, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Wow, my goodness, we could get into that, all right? But it is God saying that for those who are faithful, for those who are true, for those who come against you or come to test you, God will allow them to recognize that he is with you. My, my, my. Uh, you know, that's a whole, we could get deep into that. All right, we can continue that in the chat. But it is so important that as believers, just remain steadfast and true. Okay, just persevere. That's all God is asking of us. And God himself will exalt you in due season. And if we're going to reign with Christ, then guess what? Nations and peoples and those who rejected Christ and those who laughed at you and mocked you and jeered you and for some may even kill us. The Bible says when they come to Christ, which involves the church, us, the believers who persevere, Every knee will have to bow. My, my, my. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I want to encourage someone tonight. Endure. Just keep on persevering. Okay? Verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Okay? Now, 2,000 years. That's when John had this revelation 2,000 years ago. Quickly for them, they never envisioned it would take 2,000 years. And yet, guess what? Today, we can indeed say he's coming quickly. And yet, it still might be another 2,000 years. But we ought to live as if in the next 2,000 milliseconds, Jesus Christ can come. Or in the next 2,000 hours or 2,000 days, Jesus Christ can come. He says what? We should... Uh, he will, he says, uh, he says, verse 12, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. All right. So if we keep the faith, even though things get much tougher, God will make you a pillar. A pillar is something that, that, that holds up a building. Okay. A pillar is, a, is something that is foundational. God says, if you just hold on, I'll make you stronger. Just hold on to him. I will make you stronger against all the tests and all the trials. Okay? God is going to strengthen us. Okay? And verse 12 again says, I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. Praise God. Praise God. Ezekiel 48 verse 35 says, talking about Jerusalem, the vision that Ezekiel saw. He says, it was round about 18,000 measures and the name of the city from that day shall be the Lord is there. We know that as Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is there. Right? It's gonna, there's going to be a new name. Praise God. Just like how God was present with Adam in the garden. Praise God. So it is that when God establishes the new heaven and the new earth, he's going to dwell amongst men. Praise God. He's going to live with us. Praise God. In a, in a, in a, in a way much more than, than for those of us who have the Holy Spirit. What we have right now is just a down payment, just a deposit, just a small amount, praise God, of God's presence. Praise God. And he says, I'm going to put, give you a new name. Praise God. I'm going to give you a new name. Praise God. And uh, the name of the city of my God, which is in New Jerusalem. And I will write upon him, my new name. All right? So remember now, name in your Bible means reputation. Okay? So what we have is God identifying with the believer. God is, when he says a new name, 
I'm, I'm going to identify. Uh, that's what the, the word name means. Shem in the, in the Hebrew, right? Onoma in the Greek, right? It means reputation, character, identity. So God is saying, I'm going to identify myself with you. Praise God. Again, the issue of identification is everything for us and also for God. Over and over, Old and New Testament, we are told to identify with the God of Israel if we want deliverance and redemption. When you are baptized in the name of Jesus, you are being identified with Christ. That's what Romans 6 means. As many as have been baptized into Christ. That's what is all about identity, right? When we receive the Holy Spirit, you are being identified with his nature. It is all about identity, okay? Man-made religions and religious systems will always attack authentic believers who want to be identified with Christ, okay? This is why God always finds himself working with remnants and not the mainstream because the mainstream... Don't want to identify with the truth. So later in Revelation, we will read about God judging the false religious systems of this world that billions of people follow in full confidence, believing them to be safe and correct. But the Christian church today falls within that category of not wanting to be identified with the true Christ. There is a false Christ that men have developed that they want to follow, okay? And so we find people today settling or, or exchanging the true Christ for an easier, cheaper, more pleasant religion consisting of bumper sticker slogans, humorous sermons, and entertainment, right? That is the church today that is... Uh, uh, so popular. Now, let's go on to the next church. The church in Laodicea, verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. We've heard many sermons preached on this, but we got to understand the context. Laodicea was a very wealthy city and their main industry was processing wool. And this wealthy and influential city, they brought water in through an aqueduct. And just like in our modern day cities today, all the trappings of wealth and the best life, the best that life could offer was available to them. And so it opens by talking about God as the Amen, the Amen. And today we, 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 we think of Amen as, you know, we end our prayers meaning the end. But in, in Hebrew, Amen or Amen means truth or faithful. That's what it means. Truth or faithful. All right? So it means we agree that a statement is true, all right, or we attest to the faithful saying. So when Jesus is described as the Amen and the one who is faithful and true witness, Christ is called God's witness. The Father is not referred to as the witness. Jesus is witness to God's nature and will. And Jesus is the one who brings that nature and will to us. That's what John 1 means when it says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, 
full of grace and truth. So Jesus, the Son of Man, as he's described in chapter 1, the humanity of God is, we, is, 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 is how the divinity of God is manifested to human beings. The only way that God could manifest his divinity to us mortals was God himself had to become human. Okay? So that image, that being that John is looking at, it is the same one God. But again, we said it is a dual, it is God in his duality, not a trinity, in his duality. The seven spirits, the ancient of days, all speaks of his divine nature. Okay? His, his godness. But when he speaks of the son of man, him, he that was dead and is now, it speaks of the same God, but his humanity, who we know as Jesus Christ. So Jesus is the faithful witness, the one who testifies of God's authenticity. Okay? So verse 15 and 16 says, Thou art neither hot nor cold. Okay? So again, this aqueduct that was built to bring water into the city, if it were below ground, it would have maintained its coolness. It would have maintained its coolness. And everybody knows that cool or cold water is refreshing. This water was not hot. There's nothing like a hot cup of tea to soothe your nerves and to, 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 to you know, there, there, there's, there's something that a hot cup of tea or hot water does for the body. But this water, because it was uh, brought in this, it was lukewarm. So you, it, 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 it was not refreshing like the cool water. It was not soothing like hot water, and so no one could drink it in its current state. Okay? No one was, could drink it in its current state. And so God is using something they were familiar with to describe their faith. Okay? So we would think of cold being worst, lukewarm in the middle, hot being the best. But God says no. If it's cold, there, there's, some, there's still some use because at least you're far away from God and, and perhaps you can see yourself and turn. If you're hot, then you're useful to God. But when you're in the middle, God says you're at your worst. You're at the worst. So the warning so far that we've covered in all these churches to unrepentant believers of the seven congregations, notice says, the, the, the results, if they don't repent, says, one, they may not eat from the tree of life. They will not receive the crown. God will make war against them. Each will receive what their deeds have earned. They will be blotted out of the book of life. They will not receive a new name, nor will they bear the name of God. And now God says he will spit them out of his mouth. Okay? In other words, every identifiable characteristics and advantage of being redeemed has been erased. Okay? When you look at all these churches collectively, and see the result. But notice, God looks at their condition, but he gives them all space. He offers them grace and an opportunity to repent. So, the judgment is not because of the condition he finds them in. Don't miss that, folks. The judgment upon them is not because he has found them in this condition. The judgment come as a result of their unwillingness to repent. Believers, saints of God under the sound of my voice, our condition before God will never be perfect. 
every one of us at any given time will always have some fault and some area in our, in our lives that don't measure up to God's standards. That in itself will not prohibit you. That in itself will not deny you. What will prohibit you from entering into eternal life and receiving your crown will be your unwillingness to repent at the preaching of God's word. So every time we hear the word preached, we hear the word taught. Today, many people just look at the pastor and the preacher as somebody who is supposed to tell them what they want to hear. There is more and more prevalent today a great disrespect and disregard for the shepherd, the voice, the man of God that God has placed in our lives to teach us and to tell us how to live and to warn us. And here God is saying to the church and to every believer, you risk having your names removed if you Choose not to repent, not to change, not to turn, okay? So many people today, I am literally, I'm not going to say afraid in the terms of being fearful, but I'm very hesitant today to talk to people because it's amazing when you try to show people the right and the truth. Everybody has their own views have their own perspective, and, do, do, you know, I'm just another voice. I'm just another man speaking. No one respects or regards the pastor's voice. Remember, to the angel of the church, right? Okay? Many of these churches, the condition they were in was as a result of the leaders who were not adhering to the word of God. And so this adds to the condition of the church. All right? Now, these believers in Laodicea became lukewarm and it put them at risk of having their salvation history reserved. Why? Because their focus was on their personal wealth that made them complacent and totally insensitive to their actual spiritual condition. Okay? Verse 17 says, They say, I am rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing. Okay? Guess what? It is the same thing written in Hosea 12 and verse 8. Hosea 12 verse 8 says, And Ephraim said, Yet I am become rich, I have found me out substance in all my labors. They shall find none iniquity in me that were sin. The NIV says, Ephraim boasts, I am very rich. I am very rich. I have become wealthy. With all my wealth, they will not find in me any iniquity or sin. So this, is, was, not, this was not a new condition that this church found themselves in, folks. Okay. What a warning for believers in all ages. It is not that material wealth is being attacked or condemned or made to be an indication of spiritual poverty. It is that wealth and abundance must be handled very carefully. We must depend on God to help us be good stewards over our prosperity or it can all too easily become our downfall and either this pursuit of it or the attainment of it can consume us. The love of money is still the root of all evil. Okay? Unfortunately, too often it is automatic for wealthy believers to think that their wealth is an indicator of spiritual blessings. That they are living in tune with God's will. And so they become proud and see themselves as spiritually safe and look down upon those less fortunate. But the lesson here teaches us 
that the abundance or lack of it is not connected with spiritual with our spiritual condition. We can be wealthy and faithful, or we can be poor and felt and faithful. We can be wealthy and disobedient, or we can be poor and disobedient. Verse 18 tells us the solution to this. He says, I counsel thee, buy gold tried in fire and white raiment that you might be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Well, guess what? Gold has to do with salvation. Okay? Gold has to do with redemption, God's grace. Now, for us, it might be free, but it costs Jesus' life. Okay? The only way we can purchase redemption is with the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay? He says, uh, white raiment. White raiment speaks of righteousness. That's what it speaks of, righteousness. How does that come? Through the blood of Jesus Christ. So, here he is saying that sincere submission to Christ and allegiance and obedience to him is what is required for those who are satisfied with their material gain and all they're chasing in after in life is only wealth and health and material goods. Okay? For those whose lives as Christians, as believers, if all that your life's journey is about getting rich, having more money, building a house, living a comfortable life, if that's all it is about for you, God says you are poor and you need to go and purchase salvation by submitting to the blood of Jesus Christ all over again. Verse 19 says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous and repent. God is asking us to change our ways. He says, if you have fallen away, if you find yourself fitting the description of any of these churches as a believer, and I'm sure all of us, when we measure ourselves against these churches, we should all be crying guilty. And just as how the message of repentance was preached throughout the Old Testament, that was John's, the, John the Baptist's message. That was Jesus' message. This was the message of the apostles in the book of Acts. And it ought to be the message of the church today. And again, it's the message of the church to the church. It's the message of the church to the church. It's the message of the church to the church. Repent. Again, we are dealing with the book of Revelation. It is a book that many really don't want to get into because it is indeed a somber book. It's a book meant to awaken us because it is dealing with man's current spiritual condition. It's meant to jar us. It's meant to awaken us. It's meant to arouse us from our sleep, from our deadness. And so I hope that as we study the conditions of these churches. It doesn't mention them smoking. 
doesn't mention them committing sins that we today would easily identify as, you know, with the ungodly. And yet God was not even looking just at the acts. He was looking at the motives. He was looking at the heart. That's what God is judging. And so I pray that as we hear these words, let the word pierce our hearts. And let it uncover and expose the truth of our spiritual condition. And like the writer says, he that hath an ear, let him hear. Let us hear what the Spirit says unto the church. And let us repent. God bless you. We continue our journey. We pray that you will join with us. Until next time, God bless.